This is the second of a pair of maths casts in which I investigate a scheme that I hope, for some people, makes integration by parts easier and more straightforward. In this part two, I plan to apply my scheme to the cyclic integration by parts problem. First though, I'd like to just remind you how the scheme worked. We'll choose a reasonably simple integral. Integral of x squared cos x. Now remember how it works? I take the power of x and put it in the left hand column and the cos x in the right hand column. I then fill in the left hand column by continuously differentiating until I get to zero. That's pretty simple, eh? Now on the right I do continuous integrations of the cos. Just have to be careful to get all the minus signs right. Remember the integral of cos is sine and the integral of sine is negative cos. I used the convention that when I'm integrating a product I connect the product with a horizontal red line. So there's the integral I'm trying to perform, x squared cos x. I then fill in diagonal blue lines from top left to bottom right. Each of the diagonal blue lines gives me the terms in the product in the answer. Finally at the bottom I fill in another horizontal red line for integration, but fortunately that integration contains zero, so it won't contribute anything other than the final plus c. And then at the very end I must remember to alternate the signs, plus, minus, plus, minus. The answer to the integration by parts can now be written down at sight just by creating the products indicated by the sloping blue lines. And there it is. I must admit, even I found that quicker and easier than using the integration by parts formula. You do have, just have to be a little bit careful with the minus signs though. Notice that plus 2x cos x. There were two minus signs there. One on the 2x and one on the cos x. I'm going to stay with this example for a moment and do something rather foolish with it. Instead of going right to the end of the integration by parts, I'm going to stop short. Now remember, stopping short means that there will still be an integral left in the answer that we haven't finished performing. I'm going to stop short in the third row, the one with 2 and negative cos x in. I'm going to keep that integral at the end without performing it. So let me put a red horizontal line there. So now, I'll start my integration by parts using the blue sloping lines, but I'll stop at that point. So there are the two product terms up to that point using the diagonal lines, and now we finish using the horizontal red line at the bottom, which gives me the integral of 2 times negative cos x. What I've written here in the bottom line is certainly true. You can even see that when you integrate that cos you get sine, and so it repeats the line above it where the answer is complete. It's true, but it really is a rather foolish, ridiculous thing to have done, to stop short like that. That's true in this example, but when we come to cyclic integration by parts, this stopping short trick will be crucial. Let's move on and do a cyclic integration now. Cyclic integration by parts is useful when one of the functions is an exponential and the other is a trig function like sine or cos. I'm going to give this integral a name because it will be useful later to refer to it with a single letter name. I'm going to call it i. Before we start the process, can we anticipate what might happen? What are we going to put in the left-hand column? Well, actually it doesn't matter. We could choose the exponential or the sine. But whatever we put in that left-hand column, when we differentiate it continuously, we're never going to get to zero. The exponential will just keep creating new exponentials, and the sine will just keep creating new causes and signs. At first sight, that seems rather discouraging, but let's just plow ahead and see what happens. As it doesn't matter what choice I make, I'm going to choose the left-hand column to be the exponential and the right to be the sine. Let's start with the differentiation. Each time we differentiate the exponential, we'll put out an extra 2. Of course, it'll go on forever so we better stop somewhere. I'll go down three or four rows. On the right hand side we need to integrate. Just remember that sine integrates to negative cos, cos integrates to sine, and each time we pull out a one-third in front. 
this column would also go on indefinitely. There's no hope of getting any zeros there. OK, still a bit discouraging, but let's keep going. Since things go on indefinitely, we'd better stop somewhere, like we did in the previous case where it was a bit foolish. Look at the third row here. That third row has 4e to the 2x and minus a ninth sine 3x. At some point in the procedure, the integration by parts formula would give us the integral of the product of those things, the integral of 4e to the 2x times minus a ninth sine 3x. But look, actually isn't that just the original integral, e to the 2x sine 3x, but with a new coefficient, minus 4 ninths. If you've got any instinct for algebra, that is a promising development. Let's do the integration by parts using our scheme and stop at that stage. So, on the left-hand side, the top red horizontal line, the integral i, e to the 2x times sine 3x. On the right-hand side, the two products that come from the blue diagonal lines. Let's just write them out. Ah, but wait, what have I forgotten? I forgot to put in the alternating signs, didn't I? Take that as a lesson for you. You must remember that, and it's so easy to forget. There they are. I'm glad I remembered that, or I would have had to record this all over again. OK, so the next term will be minus and minus, so plus 2e to the 2x and a ninth sine 3x. And that's the place where I'm going to stop. And so now there will be an integral left over, the one with the horizontal red line that's lowest, the 4e to the 2x times the negative a ninth sine 3x. But now we see very easily that that remaining integral is nothing other than minus 4 ninths times i. Let's write the equation out again that way, and also tidy up the blue terms by collecting the constants in front. That is a very happy result. Because that minus 4 ninths is a different coefficient to the 1 that we had in front of the i right at the beginning, we can take that term over to the left-hand side and collect. We'll get 13 over 9 times i. And on the right-hand side, we'll have some fully integrated stuff. I should remember to add the plus c, of course. So now all I have to do is multiply both sides by 9 thirteenths. I'll leave the 1 thirteenth at the front and take the 9 inside the brackets, cancelling it with the 9s and the 3s that are inside there. And there is my integration by parts performed. I'd like to set you an exercise to try now. It'll be another one rather like this, but instead of 2 and 3, why don't we make it a and b? Then we'll have a general formula. Let's do the integral of e to the ax cos bx. Here's my answer so you can check it. Right at the end, I multiplied the top and the bottom of the expression by b squared in order to simplify things a little bit. Well, that's about it. I hope I've convinced you that this is a rather beautiful little scheme for doing these integration by parts. I only learned it recently myself from a student here in my own institution. I think I'll be using it in future. There's just one kind of integration by parts I haven't managed to address with this particular scheme, and that's the one involving polynomials in x multiplied by logs. Things that didn't seem to work there. Perhaps you'd like to mess around a bit with, with it yourself and see if you can get it to work. I'd certainly be interested to hear if you do.